go freaking look at the research. Stop saying that there's no evidence. There is evidence, and it's documented, and it is out there for everybody to take a look at. So if we choose not to look at it, it's no longer ignorance, it's arrogance. This is Jennifer. So we could do the interview there under those trees? She's a scientist at the Washington State Fish and Wildlife Service. For the past year, Jennifer's team of scientists and volunteers have been conducting an experiment in the waters outside of Seattle. An experiment that yielded some weird and, well, kind of disturbing results. These are mussels. So we put a handful of mussels, usually between six to eight, inside of an aquaculture bag. We put them in the cage. And we transplant them there at the low tide at about 100 different locations. We leave them out for about three months in the water. And over that time, they're absorbing all of the chemicals that they're eating. And then after about three months, we retrieve them. We take them back to our lab, and we open them up, and we put about 30 mussels into a jar. And then basically, we just grind it up with one of those immersion blenders and make a, like, a little mussel shake out of it. And then we send that off to a laboratory, and that gets analyzed for chemicals, and then they send us back the results. We found a number of drugs in the mussels that people take. We found antibiotics in all of the mussels that we tested. They were exposed to numerous different kinds of antidepressants. They had heart medications in their systems. We did find oxycodone as well. It's an opioid drug. We found this chemotherapy drug as well in the water, which was actually one of our kind of biggest concerns because a chemotherapy drug is a cancer-causing agent. When I was really young, I had an issue with depression and anxiety. So I had a really hard time at school because I was having panic attacks all the time. I used to take pills to help things, but then take other pills to help other things. I was given um, Zoloft, Effexor, uh, Clonazepam, Ativan, Xanax, um, what else was there, Wellbutrin. Trazodone, Lyrica, which is actually an anti-seizure medication, but they ran out of medications to give me, so they gave that to me, and then my nose started bleeding at nighttime. Because I was on antidepressants that made me not focus, I had to take Dexedrin, which is an ADHD medication, which is for focusing, but then that would give me crazy anxiety. I went to different doctors. Every time I told them that I wanted to be either off the medication because it wasn't working for me and causing side effects, or lower the dose, they would actually double the dose. And I felt like a zombie all the time, just not myself. Until I went on Facebook and I saw things about CBD. In 1999, the United States government filed a patent for the medical use of a group of compounds that appear to help and sometimes cure an unusually wide variety of medical conditions. The compound most mentioned in this patent is called cannabidiol. Cannabidiol is sometimes known as CBD. Cannabidiol, or CBD, is a compound commonly found in the cannabis plant that federal patent was issued to Aidan Hampson and Julius Axelrod, who were federal scientists. Axelrod won the Nobel Prize for his work on neurotransmitters. 
When most of us think about cannabis, we think about people getting high. So, the thing in cannabis that gets you what we call high is something called THC. THC is a compound in the cannabis plant. But THC is just one of hundreds of known compounds inside the cannabis plant, and it is the only one of those compounds that makes you high. These compounds are called cannabinoids. The two most commonly found cannabinoids in cannabis are THC and another one, CBD. Hello. I'm one of the first people that started growing CBD-rich cannabis that I know of. I'm actually a pioneer in that movement because I'm one of the people that said, hey, CBD is really important. In the 70s, early 80s, and early 90s, most of the industry and the breeders have been dominated by people who like to get high. So the direction that the breeders went was who can make the highest THC you know, plant that's going to knock your brains out. So the growers, they bred out the CBD. CBD for the last 40 years has been bred out of cannabis because it basically curbs the high for that recreational purpose. Now we've bred it back into these plants and we have an amazing set of strains of plants that are incredible. If someone is in severe pain and it could be debilitating, that is horrible. Unfortunately, physicians have a very limited arsenal for pain medications, and a lot of times opioids would be prescribed for them. There are real problems with opioids. They're not a great treatment, and the reason is we, we become tolerant to them over time. So what happens? People take more opioid, their pain level drops, and they say, ah, that really worked, and then over the next few months, pain level comes back up. They take more opioids, pain level drops. The levels just keep rising. What we find, however, is cannabis can have pain blocking effects. There's a pretty big body of research that says cannabis is effective for chronic pain. I reviewed thousands of pages of the literature and I really looked at it carefully. And I started treating my patients with cannabis and with all of those patients, there's an 87% reduction in pain, 81.5% improvement in sleep, 73% report improved handling of stress, 76% improved quality of life, 53% improved energy, and 43% improved focus. And then of the people who are on opioids, 77% of them lowered their opioids. 11% stopped them. First of all, I came to you and I was using OxyContin. Right. Very scary. I forget the dosage, but it was, it was considerable. You were taking 40 milligrams four times a day and 30 milligrams three times a day. Okay, so now I take, uh, well, I'm prescribed 90. Right. But I don't even take that much. You're basically on 76% less medication. It started with me um, forgetting to take a pill until four hours later and realizing I don't hurt. So I took less of my prescription than I would have and found out some days I can take a lot less. I can get off these things. There's some research that suggests that cannabis has an opioid sparing effect where you need less opioids to get the same effect. The pain blocking effects of cannabis is one. The pain blocking effects of opioids is one. You add them together, two. No, you add them together, it's three. That's synergy. I've had a number of patients that just used CBD and felt that it really took their pain down very, very quickly. In 2016, 64,000 Americans died from opioid overdoses. Some of those were heroin, a lot of them were fentanyl or oxycodone. In terms of direct toxic effects of cannabis in any form, there were zero deaths in 2016 from cannabis. So, uh, which is the bigger danger here? Yeah, I know. It's what in happened. Oakland, California, brothers Andrew and Steve D'Angelo own a cannabis dispensary called Harborside which has over 200,000 registered consumers. The dispensary focuses on medical cannabis. 
We've really helped introduce CBD and cannabis retail to the world. It's something I'm really proud of. We have tinctures and capsules and oils, all with different ratios of CBD uh, and THC, and sometimes just pure CBD. Andrew and I didn't start Harborside with the idea of creating a business or making money. That wasn't our main objective. We knew we had to make money in order to exist, but we had a greater mission, to tell the world the truth about cannabis. All right, thank you. Have a great day. Thank bye you. Bye. People started getting better, whether it be a veteran who was coming off opioids to deal with their pain and their trauma, or whether it be somebody with cancer, or whether it be somebody with arthritis. I called every single commercial testing laboratory in the Bay Area and asked them to test our cannabis. Because if I was going to call it medicine, if I was going to provide it to people who had compromised immune systems, I needed to know exactly what was in it, and I needed to know that it was safe. Every single one of those commercial laboratories refused to test our medicine out of fear of federal prosecution. So we started Steep Hill Laboratory. Now we had a laboratory telling us, OK, this is really strong, high THC cannabis. And wow, this one doesn't have quite as much THC in it. It has this other stuff called CBD in it. There was low CBD content in the supply, really, of, of California's entire cannabis market at that point, as far as we could determine. It had been bred out of the plant pretty much exclusively. It seemed like a crisis to us. We started to say to ourselves, well, how do we get more of this compound into the plant. So what we did is we identified 10 strains of cannabis that had the highest CBD content. We went back to the growers who had supplied us with that cannabis, and we encouraged them to, to grow more of it. Well, in the beginning, they, they were kind of reluctant to do that because they were like, man, if we just grow this CBD-rich cannabis that doesn't get people high, is there going to be a market for it? So I had to guarantee growers that we would buy their product from them. The growers started to breed the CBD in and, and started to breed the, the THC out. One day in 2011, uh, a man named Jason David came into our shop in Oakland. I have a son named Jaden David. Uh, he was born perfectly fine at four months old, uh, started having seizures. <laughs> Thousand twitches a day, grandma's for an hour and a half. He was in an ambulance 42 times in the first four and a half years of his life. My son has Gervais syndrome, a very rare form of epilepsy, um, the most life-threatening epilepsy out there. I just gave him diastat. One hour he's been having these weird type of seizures. Hey, are you there? Look, he's trying to get out of it. He gets out of it for a second. <laughs> Gets out of it for a second. Hey, Jaden. <laughs> He's back in it. We followed every protocol the doctors told us to do. 12 different pharmaceuticals and nothing was working. It just kept getting worse and worse and worse. He was crying all day and all night, having grandmas for an hour and a half, sometimes up to three times a day, uh, twitching all day. It was an April night, uh, 2011. Jaden was screaming and crying in pain, four months straight, not eating, not sleeping, not pooping. Jaden was dying in front of my face. And um, I remember uh, vividly, it was raining outside. I stepped outside. Uh, I had lost everything, my house, my car, my business. Uh, and my family was really breaking apart. My father had Alzheimer's. I was trying to take care of him at the same time. I remember calling my mom that night and telling her, um, Mom, come pick up Jaden. I put him in a high chair. You have to come pick him up. I can't do this anymore. Um, I was going to commit suicide because, you know, I couldn't handle it anymore. And um, no one was helping me. I felt really alone. And next thing you know, my mom wouldn't stop yelling at me, praying, saying, please, you're the backbone of our family. Don't let this happen. How are we going to survive? If you're gone, Jay we're going to lose Jaden and your dad. Everything's going to go downhill. Uh, please don't let this happen. So um, she asked me to just have more faith in God. About three days later, I was going to a doctor's appointment, and I came across a kid smoking a joint on TV on the news, and it said it helped out his Tourette's. Well, I know Tourette's is a neurological disorder, and Jaden's Gervais syndrome. 
is the neurological issue. So I started Googling neuroprotectant medical marijuana and I came across the federal government patent, patent 6630507. I was so desperate, I was willing to try anything. So I researched and I found Harborside. He showed me videos on his phone of his child having seizures. He shared with me that none of the therapies were working, none of the pharmaceuticals were working. They were all making his son into a zombie. This was probably the story that, that really moved me to help Jason, but he said, you know, my dream, Andrew, my dream is to Ha put my son to bed and have him hug me, look me in the eye and say, I love you, daddy. And that was, that was Jason's dream because his son couldn't talk. His son didn't have language skills because the epilepsy was too severe at that time. We had never been presented with a child of that age to give cannabis medicine before. I was worried I was gonna get busted or, or even worse, Jason would get busted and his child would be taken away from him and and so we were a little nervous about that we had to very carefully consider whether we were going to take what we perceived to be an enhanced legal risk i was concerned about giving a child that young any thc of course i didn't want the kid to get stoned we had done enough lab testing at that point to know that the cbd was in certain products that we had, um, one of which was a tincture. This particular tincture would have very close to no THC in it, and we felt like we could try it. I went to church that Sunday morning. I prayed, and, um, and I asked God, you know, please don't let me hurt Jaden. I remember giving it to him that morning, and um, I remember that day vividly. Uh, Jaden smiling, <laughs> Jaden happy, Jaden dancing. Go Jaden, go, go, dance, dance, dance. I gotta thank God a million times. It was the first day I ever seen my son not have a seizure in his life. You are so beautiful to me. Dee -dee -dee. And you finally give him something that can help him for one time in his life. Just having a smile, it's like winning the lottery. And I remember the first day calling my mom and screaming and crying at the top of my lungs. Jaden didn't have a seizure today, but I've been so blessed that it's been much more than a day. It was a very, very dramatic before and after, and there was just no, no question that this was a very powerful medicine. To Raphael Mishulam, who is responsible for many of the world's most important scientific discoveries in cannabis research, including the discovery of THC in 1964, none of this was news. We have seen that in epilepsy, it blocks epileptic attacks. We published that 35 years ago. Cannabidiol blocked epileptic attacks in patients that nothing else was helping them. What happened? Nothing for 30 years. Uh, just the neurologists were not very interested. Nobody was very interested until parents found out that cannabidiol helps children with epilepsy. There's one woman whose son had epilepsy. And I was talking to her on the phone. And I was working with her, finding the right protocol. And uh, she's telling me that before, she didn't know when he could have a seizure at any moment, so she was on call 24-7. She couldn't even go to the bathroom because she had to be there for her, her son, right, who was probably five or six years old. And I'm talking to her on the phone, and she says, oh, my God, look at that. I said, what? She said, well, this is my son. His older brother is taking him for a ride in a wheelbarrow, and he's holding on. And I'm feeling like I don't have to rush out there to protect him because he's got CBD and he's doing well. And he's laughing. He's having a good time and he's laughing. And, <laughs> excuse me. Um, I said, yeah, so? She goes, well, I've never seen him laugh before. I have never seen him laugh before. It's like, 
I was so touched that my medicine allowed him to be a kid and do regular kid things. And she could now go to the bathroom. You know, it's like, you know, I'm not helping one person, I'm helping a whole family. After I saw CBD working for about a month, I started weaning Jaden off the pharmaceuticals. So I weaned Jaden off steripintol. When I weaned Jaden off steripintol, he stopped screaming and crying. After like a few weeks, I started weaning him off Topamax. After five years of eating Gerber food, Jaden started chewing. We're about to put Jaden on a feeding tube because they said kids with Gervais syndrome don't chew. Our doctors did. Well, he, I took a part of Gervais syndrome away by taking away that pill. Next, you know, I took Jaden off Depakote. These are the real withdrawals of Depakote. Uh, doctors ever tell you this? Looks like he's coming down off crack or something. <laughs> Every time I took him off a pill, it would take about six to eight weeks, and he'd bounce back from withdrawals. Uh, we got down to, to Clobazam, the hardest one, the benzo. This is the withdrawal from Clobazam. These are Clobazam withdrawals. Jane is having a seizure at 5.15 in the morning. Good job. Now, how do we how do we go and carry our bag? Remember how we carry our bag? Come on. Good job, Jaden. Let's go. After we wean him down to one, now Jaden's life uh, he goes up to 16 days seizure free. That's our longest ever. Uh, it's it's a miracle. I'll take I'll take I'll take two to five bad days a month compared to th never seeing a good day ever. The first four and a half years of Jaden's life, out of 30 days, we'd have 30 bad days. There's something very special about Jaden. He knows that um, there's something different about him. He he carries an angelic um, angelic vibe with him. He's been through so much pain and suffering. At the same time, he's still happier than anyone I've ever met in my whole entire life. You're beautiful. You know that. And even though Jaden can't talk, he always transfers the energy to me to always keep me going, to keep me strong, and to get through tough times. Because you know, once you see your kid suffering and dying, there's nothing worse. After 25,000 pills, 12 different pharmaceuticals, nothing did what CBD had done for Jaden. They make money off of sick people. We have all these commercials and ads saying, like, this pill is awesome. Um, Zoloft is so good for antidepressant, like, for depression. But then you have the long list of things that it's not good for, and death is something that could happen. But because it's so like quick, we don't look at it. So I feel like it's a little bit like that. Like we're not really getting the information that we need about these things. And we're not getting enough information about CBD. That's for sure. I think that if a lot of people had more information and if the information was coming from somewhere high up, like science and the government, it would be a lot more believable for people. You had many different government studies in the United States that all basically concluded the same thing. In 1976, the U.S. government's National Institute on Drug Abuse published a 250-page report which discussed the medical uses of cannabis. It stated that the potential benefits of cannabis should be studied. It discussed its therapeutic effects as an anticonvulsant, an antidepressant, and an antibacterial. The report referred to cannabis as reducing nausea and vomiting in cancer patients and as treating glaucoma, asthma, and pain. It stated that significant pain reduction was seen in cancer patients, and it even discussed cannabis as helping reduce tumor sizes. That study was never released. It was never referred to the National Institute of Cancer. It was never referred for, for further study. It was buried. In 1980, the National Institute on Drug Abuse came out with another report. This one also discussed, among other things, the anti-nausea effects of cannabis, specifically in chemotherapy patients, helping their appetite, and helping in the treatment of glaucoma. Again, same result, right? This study was not released. It was not referred to the National Institute on Cancer. No further research was done on it. The city of New York, under Mayor LaGuardia, conducted a five-year study into the effects of cannabis concluding, among other things, that it does not lead to addiction and that using marijuana does not lead to morphine, heroin, or cocaine addiction. Again, 
the federal government in the United States did not act on that report, did not refer it for further study. And there's also the Schaefer Commission. The Schaefer Commission was appointed by President Nixon, and its report stated that a careful search of the literature and testimony of the nation's health officials has not revealed a single human fatality in the United States proven to have resulted solely from the ingestion of marijuana, and that most users, young and old, demonstrate an average or above average degree of social functioning, academic achievement, and job performance. And then there was another one, the same conclusions. This report, by the National Academy of Science, discussed, among other things, the use of cannabis in treating depression, opiate withdrawal, tumors, and epileptic seizures. And then they, they're always coming out with these federal reports. The DEA's own administrative law judge looked at the body of scientific evidence and came to the conclusion that cannabis is the safest known therapeutically active medicine that humanity has. That is not an exaggeration. A DEA judge literally wrote that in his report. He also wrote that nearly all medicines have toxic, potentially lethal effects, but marijuana is not such a substance. And finally, in its 2017 report, the National Academy of Science concluded that the legal barriers to cannabis research represent a public health problem. It's, uh, it's crazy. It's, it's like, what does it mean? If, it, why, if you have a government, why don't you pay attention to what it figures out, you know? It makes no sense. But the whole marijuana policy has not made any sense. It was always built on lies. And we still suffer from that as a culture, as a society, as a world. I just got really desperate. I couldn't eat. I was sleeping all the time. I started to get tremors. And my heart would just race all the time, which was not helping my anxiety whatsoever. At first, I was actually really scared to try CBD. So I took it, and I instantly felt just, like, very nice, and I didn't feel anxious about anything. The next day, I went to work, and I think the CBD was still in my system a little bit because I felt super confident that day. It just started working really well for me. I stopped getting panic attacks. Um, I felt more social because the anxiety was more calm. I felt happier and more uplifted, more positive. It also helped with my digestion. Um, I didn't have any more stomach issues from the anxiety. I am completely off of pharmaceuticals now, and I only take CBD twice a day. For CBD and cannabis medicine in general to become mainstream, high-level clinical trials are crucial. Very often, isolated anecdotes by themselves are not enough evidence for doctors. For example, if a patient says, I used cannabis and it healed my arthritis, we don't know which exact strain of cannabis the patient used and what compounds were in it. Also, it could be that the arthritis just happened to go away regardless of the cannabis. But often, persistent anecdotes can point scientists in the direction of what to study. Like in this crazy story out of Tel Aviv, Israel, one of the leading countries in the world in cannabis research. Patients suffering from leukemia often undergo bone marrow transplants. In many of these transplants, a deadly disease develops in which the newly transplanted bone marrow attacks its new host. This is called graft-versus-host disease. It's a terrible disease. In cases where it's severe grade 3 and 4, mortality rates are over 80%. Patients lose their skin they lose their epithelial cells in the GI. They have diarrhea, eight, 10 liters of diarrhea a day. It's a terrible disease. This is Sari Sagiv. She runs the patent office for the largest Israeli HMO. The GVHD story started when the head of bone marrow transplantation at one of our hospitals, he saw that several of his patients uh, that take marijuana for their pain or their uh, cancer, they said that they have a little bit less diarrhea when they smoke. And he said, you know, let's, uh, let's research what's uh, going on here. He went to Professor Meshulam to discuss this. Cannabidiol has been found to act very positively in autoimmune diseases. We said, maybe let's give them cannabidiol. 
He gave it to 50 patients. Seven days before their transplantation to 30 year, days after their transplantation. And the results were outstanding. He was able to decrease the amount of patients with a GVHD from something like 50% in controls to 12%. So that was for prevention of GVHD. And we said, okay, let's try now for treatment. There's no FDA approved drug for treating GVHD. We had 10 patients, very, very bad prognosis. Nine of the 10 patients responded to treatment. Nine of the 10 patients, which is incredible. Seven were complete responses. Not a little bit response, complete responses seven, and two were very good partial responses. Complete responses as in cure? As in cure. People are coming forward saying it helps my multiple sclerosis, it helps my depression, it helps my kidney disease, liver disease, cancer, neurological, autoimmune disorders, diabetes. So many things people were reporting. How could it be that one plant or one, one uh, remedy could actually help so many different things? up until the late 1980s, it was not known how cannabis interacts with the body. It was thought that maybe it disturbed the cell membranes in the brain like alcohol does or some anesthetics do. That turned out to be wrong. So remember how we said that CBD and THC are both compounds in the cannabis plant that are called cannabinoids? Well. This is the most fascinating thing that I've learned making this documentary. Our human bodies appear to be built to require cannabis. I know that's a really over-the-top sounding statement. I'll explain it in a little bit more detail. So our bodies are full of tiny receptors that are activated by cannabinoids. What does activated mean? Well, it means that when cannabinoids come in contact with these receptors in our body, the receptors get to work on an incredibly important job, regulating many of the body's systems and maintaining or restoring something called homeostasis, which is just a fancy word for the body's natural balance. Basically, this system of receptors plays a huge part in keeping the body working properly. These receptors are everywhere in the body. Most of them are in the brain and in the nervous system, but they're everywhere. In the immune system, many of our organs, the blood, the skin, everywhere. This is the reason that cannabis is effective for so many seemingly unrelated diseases. Okay, so now we're gonna tell you all of that in a little more detail. So, Rafael Mishulam is the guy who first isolated THC at the Weizmann Institute in 1964. In 1990, a team led by Lisa Matsuda discovered that the way THC works in the body was by connecting to a receptor. This receptor was later called CB1. They said, okay, this is wonderful. We have now a cannabis molecule. Now we have a receptor in the body that responds to cannabis. But does that make much evolutionary sense that we have a system in the body that is there just to react to the cannabis plant? This doesn't make a lot of physiological sense. They said, well, if there's a receptor for this, there, there must be something inside humans that triggers the receptor. And then the craziest discovery was made. Our body makes its own cannabinoids. In 1992, Lumir Hanush and Bill Devane discovered a compound made by the body that activates the same receptors that THC activates. They called this new compound anandamide. Ananda in Sanskrit means bliss. As it turns out, the way that THC works and anandamide work are quite similar. A few years later, another cannabinoid-like compound produced by the body was discovered. The name it was given was not as entertaining as anandamide. It was called 2-AG. Nearly a hundred compounds have since been discovered that are produced by the body and interact with cannabis compounds and more cannabinoid receptors have been discovered as well. So it turns out the receptors in our body aren't there just to respond to cannabis. We're producing these molecules from within. 
So, this massive system of receptors and the body's own cannabinoids was given a name. The endocannabinoid system. So endo is endogenous, from within. The endocannabinoid system is referred to as the master regulator. So it controls our body's ability to eat, sleep, rest, digest, and relax. It's regulating energy balance. It's regulating mood and emotion. The endocannabinoid system is involved in regulating the creation of new brain cells. There is a galaxy of these cannabinoid receptors throughout our entire body. The endocannabinoid system is present in every organ of our body. Name an organ, the cannabinoid receptors are there. In all of our connective tissue, in our skin. In your GI tract, in uh, the cellular level of the nerves. They're located in liver cells, they're located on pancreatic cells. In our circulatory system, in our immune system. It's pretty much everywhere. The endocannabinoid system parallels the immune system. So there really is no physiological process in our body that's not affected by the endocannabinoid system to some degree. And if that's not fascinating enough, or weird enough depending on your point of view, the endocannabinoid system is not just present in humans. This system is found throughout most animals. Almost all organisms that came out of the water have an endocannabinoid system and they're related. We recently found that hookworms contain the functioning endocannabinoid system. It's been found that truffles, mushrooms, produce endocannabinoids. Us, animals, and truffles? So to sum it up, cannabis makes cannabinoids. Humans and animals make endocannabinoids. Both cannabinoids and endocannabinoids activate the exact same receptors in the body to create a state of homeostasis. The endocannabinoid system's job is to maintain the balance of all the other systems, right? So you have a bunch of other systems that do their thing, and the endocannabinoid system sits on top of all of them to make sure that they don't go out of control. The problem in many diseases is that either there's too much or too little of a receptor, or too much and too little from an endocannabinoid. There was a PTSD study that was conducted after the 9-11 attacks in, in New York City. In the immediate area around the terrorist attacks, they got 50 people in a study, half of whom presented with PTSD, obviously related from the attacks. Half of them did not. Every single one of them who had PTSD had lower levels of endogenous cannabinoids. A deficiency in endocannabinoid receptors has also been observed in women suffering from endometriosis, an extremely painful and common condition that many women suffer from. Which is really interesting because while the largest concentration of endocannabinoid receptors is in the brain, the second largest concentration of endocannabinoid receptors is in the female reproductive system. In my practice, I see a great deal of women with gynecological issues, um, such as pelvic pain uh, due to endometriosis, uh, painful periods um, due to uh, cysts. What cannabis serves is a very natural and potent anti-inflammatory and a pain reliever. So the earliest references we have for cannabis being used to treat specifically female-related medical conditions are from the 7th century BC. In ancient Mesopotamia, they used to make a beer that contained cannabis seeds to help women going through a difficult childbirth. Numerous historical records discuss the use of cannabis in treating women's health problems. For example, in 12th century Syria, cannabis was used in the treatment of postpartum hemorrhoids and it was also used as an aphrodisiac, which I'm sure doesn't surprise anyone. There are records from medieval Azerbaijan showing that cannabis seed oil was used to treat uterine tumors. In late 16th century China, cannabis flowers were recommended for menstrual disorders. In the 9th century, a juice used to be made from cannabis mixed with other herbs to treat migraines, calm uterine pains, and prevent miscarriages.
There's a lot of people that want to see a governor and talk to him, and it's you can't see everybody, so they try to keep it as efficient so he could see as many people as possible. Here he is. So I wasn't governor, though, when you were around the last Perfect. time to get the legislation passed. So you're going to have to tell me a little bit about that history. Should I start now? Yes. OK. So it all started the summer before I started second grade. OK. So it, it all started out in the summer of 2013. We started noticing that Riley's teeth were getting very loose and we were out to lunch one day and she started swallowing her teeth and she showed me her mouth like all of her teeth it looked like a picket fence that somebody had run a truck through. At the same time I started noticing that you know whenever I would look at Riley's face the asymmetry was just something was off about it and I'm not sure if I'm imagining things or if there's something really there things just started happening like very fast, where like one side of her face started swelling so badly when she'd wake up. She was starting to get very embarrassed about her looks. I just felt that sense of urgency that something had to be done like right now. We got the CT scan and the doctor walks in and flips on the computer screen. It looked like somebody had been shot in the face with a cannon. And he walked in and he said, that's your daughter's face. And so that's when it hit me. That we, we, we ran in for a fight. And he explained to me that, you know, the swelling and the baby fat that she had, because she's only seven, it masked what was going on underneath. All of this destruction happening from this tumor. And it turned out I had a giant cell granuloma tumor. It's considered a benign bone tumor, even though it's aggressive, it would still like just continue eating away the structure of her whole face and it's life threatening and it has a high reoccurrence rate. That night, she slept with me, and I remember like the whole night, I was watching her and I was thinking, I'm gonna memorize her breathing, I'm gonna mem memorize the warmth of her skin because someday it's gonna be cold. She was gonna come out of surgery, best case scenario, deformed. She was in surgery the entire day, and when she came out of surgery, there was some tumor left behind that they just couldn't reach. From everything that we had been told, if any tumor at all is left behind, there's going to be a reoccurrence. Her face just looked like a potato sack, and there was like no formity of her face because the bones were all missing. They had said that they were going to remove all of her teeth and she would have to get implants when she's older, but for some reason, as like a Hail Mary, they decided to stitch them into the skin. They told us, we don't think those teeth will live, and when they die, they'll just fall out. I had already started researching all over the internet. There was all these different things that people were using, asparagus diets, uh, black salve, everybody's like absolutely no sugar. But as far as actually trying to shrink this tumor and keep it from reoccurring, the one thing that kept popping up very strongly was cannabis. My mom, she was like looking online, seeing what she could do, and she found cannabis, and she started giving it to me. I was scared to death that I was doing the wrong thing. I mean, you doubt yourself as a parent. Very quickly after she started the oil, her teeth started getting firmer, and that gradually like got better and better each week. Going for that next MRI was like pins and needles. What they saw was not as much inflammation as they expected, and they already started to see bone regeneration, and it was much faster than what also what they expected. And we started to see the bones like regenerating around the teeth, especially. But the most important thing was that that tumor that was left behind, it had shrunk by between 25 and 30 percent. Was she on any medication to shrink the tumor? 
She was on absolutely no medications besides the cannabis oil. And so that to me was enough proof to continue the cannabis regimen that we were on. So then jump ahead a year later, we'd gotten all these wonderful scans. We'd gone to a doctor at Johns Hopkins that deals with bone tumors such as this day in and day out. And he just kept looking at her and looking at the records and he just kept going back and forth. And he said, and this is her records? And I was like, yeah, this is her records. And he said, well, I cannot tell that that child is this child in the records because she should not look like this. this there's just no way. She was supposed to have, you know, some reconstructive surgeries. And here today, she looks beautiful and she hasn't had a single reconstructive surgery. But at the time that all of this was happening, it was illegal for children in Delaware. I was worried that, you know, what if I get caught? What if, what if my husband loses his job? My husband works for the state, so we're being very secretive about it. She told me not to talk about it. I was keeping like as many details as I could away from my husband because I want him to be able to pass a lie detector test. And then there was another problem where I couldn't take my medicine on school grounds. Every time she had to walk off school property, she felt like she was out it. Where do you want to go take your medicine? You lose friends because people judge you on like the medicine that you're taking and they think, oh, I can't be friends with them anymore. Mm. Or their parents are like, oh, they're a bad influence, stay away from them. Mm. And like in school, you just feel all alone. Yeah. It shouldn't be like that. You have people tell you that you're a bad influence? because of the cannabis? Well, what did you used to tell them in response? I would just ignore them because I know they're wrong. This pain doctor spent four hours with us. We had Riley, he looked over all her records and he said, you're already doing the right thing, but it's illegal. And then Riley's just like, well, let's make it legal then. Janie started looking for potential state legislators to recruit as allies. We can find their offices. She decided to specifically seek out someone who is a vocal opponent of medical cannabis, knowing that if she can change that person's opinion, Hello. she'll be able to get others on board. Hey, we're coming down the hallway to your office. Hey. How are you? Great to we see have you, bud. She found exactly such a legislator in Republican State Senator Ernie Lopez. How's it going, bud? Good. Good. We invited the senator to come over, and I laid out all of her medical records. And he said, so without it, how do you feel? And she said, you know, I can't concentrate. The pain is so bad. And she says, and, and I'm scared. And he's like, what are you scared of? And she said, I'm scared the tumor is going to come back and that I'm going to either end up very uh, deformed or I'm gonna die. And that just like got to him and he, he started crying. A couple of weeks later, Senator Ernie Lopez called Janie and asked her to meet with him. He handed me this paper and he said, look at this and see what you think. And it was his first rough draft of the bill and he had called it Riley's Law. Yeah, that was really cool because it was my name. <laughs> We immediately reached out for co-sponsors. Riley and her family did a lot of the yeoman's work by being in this building and meeting with different legislators and really educating them just as they educated me in the process. And that's what it takes. That's what it takes. It's amazing that you changed your mind about it. Yeah, well, it wasn't really changing my mind. It was understanding. Hey. Do you remember me? <laughs> How you doing? I <laughs> got her. You're a young lady. You're growing like a weed. Oh, you're so pretty. How's your world? Good. How do you feel? Good. People don't always want to listen to something that contradicts their beliefs. Not everybody wants to be open-minded and feel like, you know, this is the right thing. And some people just, they believe what they believe and they don't want that door opening too wide. 
It's just that people don't know about it and they don't really want to know about it. They just kind of want to like shut it out of their lives and be like, oh no, it's bad. I don't want to learn about it because they were raised that way. Oh my God, sweetheart, how are you doing? Good. It's so good to see you. And they would ask me, is she on the cannabis now? Or they called it marijuana. Is she on the marijuana now? And I'd say, yeah, she's on it. And they're like, well, she doesn't act like she's on the, that stuff. I'm like, well, what is she supposed to act like? Like, I don't understand. I will tell you the one thing that I'm not really happy about. I always have to leave the school grounds just to take my medicine. She stood up and told them how she just wanted a normal life. She wanted to be able to go to a friend's house and spend the night. And she wanted to be able to um, not be afraid of going to bed and never waking up. And they could help her with all these fears just by allowing her to use this medicine. This child is begging for her right to, to live a normal life. I would answer questions that they had. And like, there was this one guy, he was about to say no, but and then like, I talked and then he just sat right back down. <laughs> it went to the Senate for a vote. It was unanimous. Many times a big thinking change takes time. People were brought up knowing they shouldn't smoke a joint, they shouldn't touch pot, it's bad for you. Uh, they never really understood the different mechanisms in cannabis and how many medicinal values there were there. The level of knowledge of most elected officials in the areas of science is often uh, low to say, to be kind. In my caucus, I probably have a little more respect amongst people when we talk about business stuff, because I have a lot of businesses. I'm an entrepreneur. Uh, another gentleman, he's a realtor. Another, he's an insurance guy. Science? We don't have a scientist. So when you have the guys making the laws who have such a vacuum of education in this world, you oft, often need that, that, that it, that something. Our something was Riley. How can we deprive this kid of being able to live a, a, as close to a normal life as possible with the, with the cards God gave her? And who am I to have the right to do that? People say you can't change the world. You know what you say back? I can. I did. Oh. It's even better. <laughs> We've even since then had a legislator say that in his career, if he helped make one good bill that he knew that his life meant something, and he said Riley's Law was that bill. These are children we're talking about. You want to be a part of that as a legislator, not just because it's the in thing to do, because that's your damn job. I've only been off the medicine for a few days. But without it, I'm not normal. I just want to be normal again. <laughs> Two years earlier, after Riley's surgery to remove the tumor, Riley would get painful, seizure-like episodes where she would experience spasms in her legs and periods of confusion. When she had started the cannabis treatment, those went away. I'm miserable. I know. But now, Doctors wanted to have Riley undergo an EEG test. I wish I didn't have to do this test. <laughs> and demanded that Janie take her off the cannabis for two weeks. You were just out in the living room, walking in circles. Do you remember that? No. You don't remember walking in circles in a living room? I'm sorry if I might have scared you. You're not, you're not scared. I might have scared myself. You're scaring yourself? I remember telling the neurologist that I can't handle it. This is inhumane. And they were just trying to scare us into not using cannabis. I'd be better by now if I had it. <laughs> we just went right back to 
cannabis. So yeah, within 48 hours, she was back to her happy self. She said that she felt normal. And I was just living a normal life again when I was on cannabis. Riley's tumor eventually completely shrunk. And as of the completion of this film, it hasn't returned. Riley is now an activist. I was diagnosed with bone tumors. Um, that's what it did to my face. And an advocate. We also like advocate for better access. She speaks regularly at conferences around the world to researchers, doctors, growers, and entrepreneurs. Because it helped me, other kids should have a chance to be helped too. My mission in life is to help kids who are facing debilitating illnesses to have a better quality of life. When my mom gave me cannabis, it made me feel so much better, and I didn't understand why other kids couldn't have it. And she is a regular in the halls of Delaware's Congress. So I want to add some things to the law. OK. Working with legislators on improving the medical cannabis laws for children in their state. Make all Delaware doctors take a four-hour basic cannabis science course in schools. Nurses should be able to carry the medicine. Mm. Doctors just need to learn about like what the medicine is doing inside our body, even if they don't agree with using it, they should, just should know. Ah. So you don't forget. And I suspect you'll be around, won't you? Riley is now also a business owner. She and Janie started Riley's Sunshine, a company that develops products, but also provides education and data gathering. What were you living with each day as far as your Lyme disease? Um, mostly joint pains. Joint pains? A lot of, and muscle pain. Um, especially in my knees and the headaches every day. Scale of 1 to 10 before you started taking the CBD. As far as pain? 10's the worst, 1's the good. 9, 10. 9 being, like 10 being the worst. What was yours? Yeah. A 9. And then what's today? 1. Yeah. But I know how much time I lost with my kids because I spent days in bed because I didn't, I could not possibly move. And I think about those times that I've lost and I wish I had had it sooner. And no doctor I went to could help me. My husband jokes, he says, now I can't keep up with you. <laughs> Cause it's just made such a difference in such a short amount of time. Riley, what do you think when you see people that have been helped because you help people? It just makes me feel so happy that I'm like changing someone's life. And it's just, I don't know, it's, I just feel really happy and I feel proud of myself for helping someone. Like sometimes I get a little emotional because like, because of how much it helps. What does it make you think about the times that you were sick when you think about how people are helped sort of because of that now, you know? I feel like I was lucky to have the tumor or else I wouldn't be doing any of this. You really think that? You really feel that? Yeah, like all of the stuff I went through, it was worth it. <laughs> Jane, do, do you, you feel, feel the same do, way? Do you feel the same way? <laughs> 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 These materials affect our body in a very powerful way. We must learn how to look deeper. I have a laboratory for cancer research. I am part of the Technion, which is the Technology Institute of Israel. I have a PhD in molecular and genetic plant biology but I did my postdoc in cancer research. When I opened my lab, I looked always how to connect plants to cancer research. Around half a year after I established my lab, there was a publication by a Japanese group that showed that if you treat breast cancer with cannabis, you block the cancer cell's ability to migrate. And I thought that it's very interesting, and we did like preliminary experiments to see how cannabis affects the cancer cells, and the result was phenomenal. 
we saw a specificity between the types of the cannabis and its ability to attack the cancer cells. Cannabis number one affects just the prostate cancer, but not the colon and liver. And cannabis number two affects just the colon cancer, but not the prostate cancer. In at least two types of cancer, we already narrowed down to three compounds that if you have one of them, it's not affecting the cells. If you have two of them, it's very minor effect. But if you have three of them, it will kill the cells quite immediately. And the three compounds, they are not THC CBD. It's other compounds. One of them don't even have a name. It never recognized. It's a new cannabinoid. 3318B, we call it, you know? We must learn how to look deeper. Because if you want to treat now this cancer, you need to know that you have these three compounds. And you need to know how to grow them, that these three compounds will always be there. Otherwise, it won't affect this cancer. Now you're taking it to a level that scientists and physicians can appreciate. And we are there with few types of cancers and, and Alzheimer and other diseases that we're working on. Cannabis is not just one plant. Different strains of the plant contain different amounts of its various compounds, such as CBD, THC, other cannabinoids, and also terpenes, which are various oily compounds in the plant that also have medical properties. For the same disease, sometimes different patients must use different strains, because what treats one patient doesn't treat the other one. Also, the amount which is used for one patient. For one patient, it's too much. For the other one, it's not enough. Because patients are different. Because not every patient has the same amount of receptors. We've seen the fragility of life. I really had no idea how fragile we all are until I saw, went to war and went to Afghanistan because that's where I saw how quickly someone could go from like sitting, eating, playing frisbee, whatever, to laying on the ground, bleeding out. Trauma's as unique as a fingerprint. For me, it's losing some friends in combat. For many women, it's being sexually assaulted. You know, it's, um, it's having your life change in a moment. Sniper! I mean, what is PTSD? PTSD is severe life-altering trauma things start to become unbearable and jobs become hard to hold. Relationships fall apart and drugs become the easy way out and drinking and reckless behavior. Some forms it comes in like talking way too much and just overcompensating and being obviously self-conscious and considering no one else but yourself. And then I've seen other veterans who clam up and um, can't be around anyone and don't want to talk to anyone. Or for me, for instance, it's hypervigilance is a big one, where like, I just feel like I have to take care of everybody at all times and make sure there's exit routes for everybody and a plan for this and a plan for that. And it gets exhausting. This is my CBD rich plant. Like, this is gonna provide some serious relief for some people. Every week, Colin makes CBD oil in his kitchen. Often, he also makes THC-rich oil, which to many is also medically effective. 
The process is simple and involves just a few easy-to-find ingredients and a relatively inexpensive botanical extractor that you can buy online. We made four cups of this beautiful, beautiful oil. Colin gives these pills, free of charge, to veterans who need them, not just to function, but to thrive. I am the founder of a group called Veterans Walk and Talk. We hike three times a week all around Southern California. So beautiful. We get out in nature. You know, those barriers we have built up. We're like, we don't want to talk about certain things. So all of a sudden, those barriers start to break down. We start sharing really important things that we probably needed to share for a long time. These hikes are essentially a support group that aims to help veterans by bringing them out of isolation, have conversations, and use medical cannabis to help manage their PTSD symptoms. So how does it help you? Cannabis? Yeah. How long do you have? I mean, I was as low as it got, dude. I was homeless drug addict, burned all my bridges, addicted to opiates and on antidepressants that made me want to kill myself, Wellbutrin, you know, in particular, really gave me suicidal ideations. Um, I was withdrawing from opiates one day and a friend brought cannabis over and put it in a tea for me telling me it was Valium. I felt good. I never, I never really looked back. I had this huge faction of patients in my internal medicine practice who were claiming they were getting benefit from this plant. And I was very skeptical. I was, you know, basically dismissive of these claims because I thought they were just drug-seeking stoners. That's what I'd been taught in medical school. And then I began losing a lot of veterans in my practice to suicide. And that was when I had this real epiphany that, you know, all these lousy pharmaceuticals that I'm writing for patients every day are not helping them. It often they were, you know, causing more toxicity than this natural plant. So the, the military veterans in my practice who were using the plant were actually describing this as life-saving for them. And I started to finally examine the scientific literature. And I regretted how judgmental I was over these past many years, because I probably could have saved more lives. All these vets who killed themselves may have, you know, who knows? I wonder if they could have benefited from this plant. I don't know any veteran, really, who hasn't had a close friend um, leave from suicide. I know I've had my fair share. I've had guys in my hiking group, you know, take their own lives. And, uh... I really don't know, like... I tr it's hard for me to think about how much suicide is in every day because, like, I love living so much, you know? I, I used to really hate it. Like, I used to want to be numb and away from the world, and I didn't care about anyone or anything. And... <laughs> I just can't imagine ever being that again. This plant, I, it has given me my life back. I had four knee surgeries, and I have a torn ACL right now. So I've torn my ACL five times. I have chronic back pain, but I'm pretty much pain-free, climbing, hiking several miles a week. And I mean, I'm in the best shape of my life. And I, I'm nursing all these injuries, so what does that tell you? It's all because of this plant. There's tons of meds that I prescribe to patients every day that make them high, right? Whether it's pain pills, benzodiazepines like Xanax, all of them have the potential to cause euphoria, and we don't condemn those pills. But yet, when it comes to this natural, God-given plant, we vilify it, we treat it like it's so dangerous, like it's plutonium, when in fact it's far safer than most of the lousy prescriptions that I write for people every day. CBD is added to gourmet dishes and cocktails 
at this private, expensive CBD brunch. This food and education event is organized by a startup company developing new CBD products. Cannabis products are often extremely expensive. Even for just CBD, prices can be daunting. CBD stores and products have been popping up everywhere, on the streets and online. An explosion of startups hoping to make a lot of money in a new industry with massive potential. But very often, this means that if you don't have a lot of money, you cannot afford it. I don't think a lot of people can afford to buy CBD in a health food store if they're not making a certain income level, and I think that's not fair. I mean, the truth is the cannabis plant is no more expensive to grow per pound than broccoli. And so there's really no um, reason that it should cost exponentially more than broccoli. I was raised pretty poor, single mother on welfare with disabilities. Me and my sister and mom, we lived in a 300 square foot converted motel room. And um, it was a kind of strange poorness because we happened to live in the Pacific Palisades School District. And we would go to school with rich kids that lived in 5,000 square foot homes. So, of course, none of them could know about our converted motel room. After 10 years away from the vitamin and supplement company he founded but still owns... It was like the third time I've been here in 10 years. Klee Irwin has temporarily returned to his company with the purpose of launching a new line of dozens of CBD products derived from hemp, which is a type of cannabis that contains almost no THC whatsoever. We're going to start off with the oil update. What form of oil did they use? The crude? Mm, these are cool. So th these do have CBD in them. There's multiple ways to pack this out. We can put them in there individually unwrapped, or we can put them in there wrapped too. Oh, really pretty. I have a new heartfelt, emotional mission for what we can do as a team of human beings. I've really been focused on nonprofit work for the last 10 years of my life. And the way I'm looking at this CBD mission that I hope to become all of your mission is, um, is as an act of love and service to society. I don't care about making money on it. And so um, I want to see a single mom on welfare with a daughter who needs this medicine to be able to buy it, and she can't at this point. And so we're going to make sure that happens by making it available to the masses at the very lowest price that we can possibly go. Klee's supplement company was not previously involved in the cannabis market. But unlike many of the smaller startups creating expensive CBD products, Klee's company sells to the mass market at large scale. I want to get it into the market in as many foods and beverages and supplements as possible at as low of a price as we can possibly go and still run our pay the bills and in some sense force the competitors that are charging the higher pricing and, and force the entire market to come down for one simple reason. I think our nation is on the brink. When I first started taking CBD, I thought it would be something that could help with my ADD, just the inability to focus on one thing consistently. And CBD really surprised me because it just focused me by calming me. Plus, everybody said that it uh, made me more easy to get along with. Oh, made that up? Just, wow, <laughs> amazing. So then I thought, wow, well, if CBD had this impact on me to calm me, it could really calm a nation that may be at, at a high point of nervousness, right, in, in our history. In order to crash the prices of CBD without losing money, Klee needs to convince cannabis growers to sell him the raw CBD materials for an unusually low price, a task that is not proven to be very easy. A lot of people said, look, it's a seller's market, so I'll milk the situation while I can. One grower in Canada whom I met with literally ran me off his property, screaming, don't do what you said you're going to do, because you're going to ruin it for the rest of us. So for now, we're pretty much 
eating it profit-wise, but that's okay because we make money on our other products. Let's put a bird up here. I want to represent freedom, and birds are the symbol of freedom because they fly. You know? So I don't care if people buy my brand. Um, everything doesn't have to be about money. I want people to be their their best and to feel safe and to be harmonious and um, healthy. So if I see somebody in a store buying a CBD product that's not mine, I'm I get I get happy. I'm like really happy. This is a helpful molecule that has profound impact, and so we can eventually shift ourselves from the country that consumes most of the world's prescription drugs to maybe someday a country that is drug-free, pharmaceutical-free, except in cases where a pharmaceutical is absolutely necessary because no plant medicine that's safe can solve the problem. Cannabis is wonderful medicine, but we are still in the start of our knowledge. The nitty gritty of it, we're still all trying as scientists to figure this out. Um, we sort of just scratched the surface, I believe, over the past few decades. There is a huge amount of work still to be done. We will know specific compounds inside the cannabis plant. What's the mechanism of action? What uh, does that compound do in our body? I believe that within the next decade or so, we shall have quite a few cannabinoid-based drugs on the market. Cannabis won't solve all the illnesses in the world. It will be another tool in the toolbox of the physician to treat his patient. Nobody's ever died from the cannabis plant in any quantity. This is a human rights issue. Cannabis medicine has created amazing results for patients, even if it's dying with dignity, even if it's that they're not completely zonked on opiates. I mean, that's a huge gift to give. And at the end of the day, I'm a healer. I want to help people, I want to give them hope, and I want to do, do no harm. It'd be a sin if I didn't tell other people how important this medicine is. A few years after CBD saved his son's life, Jason opened a dispensary in Modesto, California, and named it Jaden's Journey. Jason's store focuses heavily on medical cannabis. Whenever anyone walks in the store, whatever we have to do to help them walk out with medicine, we will, because I was that person that couldn't afford the medicine. I love helping people. I love seeing improvement in people. I love hearing when people walk in each day and say, hey, you know what, my kid could walk, my kid could talk, my kids went seizure-free for a month, three months, nine months, two days even, you know? Uh, it's very gratifying. This is only here as a treatment, 100% because of patients, because people wanted this. We've all taken control of our own medical journey in a lot of ways. We have an option now to get the facts known, to get informed, and make a choice. I think we are going to see an increasing number of people who start to take responsibility for their own health and become present in their own well-being. The first step of taking your power back is to educate yourself. Healthcare practitioners really need to educate themselves on the endocannabinoid system and on medical cannabis very quickly. Physicians need to learn to trust the patient. If physician cannot help you, you have a right to treat your health. Is that good? A little bit more. Okay. You know, sometimes when someone discovers something good for them, they become, you know, manic creatures. You know, like when you become a vegetarian <laughs> and all of a sudden, like, you start annoying everyone about that. <laughs> Yeah. Are you like that? I was at first because I found this miracle drug. Well, not even a drug. I found this plant that completely helped me with everything. It fixes headaches, anxiety, depression, like so many, so many things. And I would just preach that at people. But then I kind of forgot that there's still the stigma around cannabis and CBD. A lot of people are still like, well, it's 
it's a drug, so I don't want to be high from it. And it doesn't matter how much you tell people, well, it's non-psychoactive. Um, they still are really skeptical about it. And I understand that because that's how I was at first. But yeah, I definitely was a preacher, but now I know that you just have to let people, you can talk and then just let them decide for themselves.